We're going to move on to the second question. Right, now this one comes from paper one under probability and fundamental counting principles. Very powerful. Absolutely nice question. Let's just go and see what is going on. Remember, in probability, you're writing probability out of around 15 marks in paper one. It's always the last questions of the paper. It can be anywhere, but we put it at the end more often than not, right? So please do make sure that you remember your Venn diagrams, your tree diagrams, and your contingency tables, your two-way tables, those tools. And the other tool that is important is the fundamental counting principle, right? And then if you've got those, then you can be able to work out probabilities. In the information sheet, there's also the formula for probability of event A and B. There's also a formula for probability of event A or B. So just check all that in the information sheet. You should do very well when you get to this. All right. So let's go and check this question. It is a question 11, all right? And this question 11 is awesome. It says to us here, first of all, it comes from Indonesia. Thank you very much, Ndu. Okay, it's a question that comes from uh, Ndumiso Mapanga. Right, Dumiso Mapanga gave us this awesome question, and let's all look into it. Thank you very much, Ndu, for giving us this awesome question. All right, so 11.1 says to us here, events A and B are independent. Okay, what do we know about independent events? Before I even go anywhere, it's important for us to read the love letter and analyze what is going on there. So when people talk about independent events, you must know that for events to be independent, the probability, let me go back to black so that it's visible, the probability of event A and event B will always be the probability of event A times the probability of event B. This identity holds if events are independent. All right. The probability of event A is 0 0.4 and the probability of event B is 0 0.25. 11.1.1. Represent the given information on a Venn diagram, right? Venn is not a car. Venn used to be a person, all right? Indicating on the Venn diagrams the probabilities associated with each region, all right? Now, how does a probability Venn diagram look? A Venn diagram, how does it look? Okay, cool. So a Venn diagram, you're going to have a nice rectangle somewhere there, okay? Beautiful rectangle like this one, right? And then you're going to put the sample space right at the top. But the important thing is I'm going to have circles inside. This first circle represents event A, and then the second circle represents event B. Now, somebody's probably wondering, must the circles intersect or not? For the fact that we are told that event A and B are independent, it means there is an intersection. It means probability of event A and B exists. It's there, okay? So you can't have it like this. This would be a big mistake because if you do this, you are claiming that there is nothing common between A and B. But we were told that these events are independent. And for independent events, the probability of event A and B exists. So I'm expecting it to look like this. Very important. And that will be event B, right? Okay, cool. Now we need to write in the values inside there and we were given probabilities. What do we know? Well, we know a couple of very exciting things. First of all, we know that we must work out what is the probability of event A and B. Right, now here is something very important. If you're going to be doing a Venn diagram, I encourage you to always begin in the middle, right? You start with the center. It doesn't matter whether this is the Venn diagram for two events or for two events or three events, right? But always start from the center and work your way out. Why? Because if you work from outside and you're trying to come in, you will overcount things. Very important. So now I want to figure out what's the probability of event A and B first, and then use that to work my way out and get all the other values for my Venn diagram. Very powerful. Right. So let's first of all try and figure out what is the value of the probability of event A and B. So A and B will be probability of event A times the probability of event B. So A was 0.4 and B is 0 0.25. If my math doesn't fail me, that's like a, a tenth, which is actually going to be 0 0.1, All right? So the intersection will have a value of 0 0.1, which I'm gonna put here as 0 0.1. That's the probability of event A and B. Now, we wanna put the values for the probability of event A. Remember what comes here is just A only, All right? We were told that the whole of A must be 0 0.4. I have already represented 0 0.1. So what is missing? So that the entire A circle gives us a value of 0 0.4, it means we are missing a 0 0.3 here. So that when you add them, you will end up with an answer of 0 0.4. Similarly, we know that the probability of B is 0 0.25. 
but we have already written 0 0.1 in that circle. That means we are just missing 0 0.15 so that we've got everything that we are interested in, right? Now, those circles and everything inside the rectangle must give us an, a total value that has a proper probability total of the sample space must always be a one, right? Remember the sample space in the, the entire probability um, amounts to one. So we're gonna go to our calculator and try and find out something interesting here, right? So the whole summation of what we have inside our Venn diagram must always amount to one. But if you do 0 0.3, you add it with 0 0.1 and you add with 0 0.15, okay? Backspace, backspace, 0.15, all right? Where's my one? Come back here. Okay, cool. So when you add all those numbers we wrote inside, they don't amount to one. They amount to 0 0.55, which means we are missing 0 0.45. Where will that be? That will definitely be outside. So this is basically where 0 0.45 will simply lie. The idea is all the values inside must always amount to an answer of one. Awesome stuff, right. Okay, that's my Venn diagram. That's the answer for the first question. Second question says, work out the probability of event A or not B. Okay, that's interesting. We are looking for probability of A or not B. How do you work that out, okay? We want the probability of A or not B. Now, this is a nice examiner. They actually told you how to express that in words. How would it look mathematically? Well, mathematically, they would ask you this way. They will say, find the probability of event A, the symbol for O, is this, right? And the symbol for not B would be a B with a prime on it. So this statement is the mathematical equivalence of the statement appearing in yellow, right? And how do you even work that out? How do you even work this out, right? So you're just gonna go and count anything that you find in A. Count all the stuff in A and count all the stuff that is not in B. That's what we're looking for. So let's go back to the Venn diagram and check this. We're looking for everything that is in A. What is in A? 0 0.3 is in A. 0 0.1 is also in A. But we need everything that is in A to be added with everything that is not in B. What else hasn't been counted? We counted 0.3, we counted 0.1, but there's also 0.45 that is not in B. So we're just looking for anything and everything that is not in B, but that will also be in A. That happens to be 0 0.3, 0 0.1, and that's 0 0.45. Do not be confused by the 0 0.1 because that 0 0.1 happens to be inside B, but we are taking it because it is inside A. And the examiner is looking for everything that is inside A as well as everything that is not in B, wherever it might be. Okay. Then the answer to this is just 0.4. That's actually going to be 0 0.85. If you add all of them, it's going to amount to 0 0.85. Be beautiful question. I hope you understand what you had to do there. That's how you work out the probability of something else or something else. Look for everything in the first thing and everything else in the second thing. Then you'll always get the answers without any problems. 11.2 is a problem of counting. This is a situation of fundamental counting principles. Let's just check the statement. It says to us here, Motors Incorporated manufactures cars with five different body styles. Four interior colors and six different exterior colors, as indicated in the table below. Right, so there's five body types. It doesn't really say here, but if you think about it, out of this statement, I can conclude that there's actually a body style one, okay, there's body style two, and so on and so on, until we get to body style five. So there are five different ways that they can actually build their body styles. Very powerful, okay, cool. Now, the question continues and says the interior color of the car must not be the same. So you've got a problem. It must not be the same as the exterior color, all right? Do we have problems like those? Look at the interior colors. There's blue, there's gray, there's black, there's red. But if you check the exterior, we're gonna have problems because I see this blue interior and there's also blue exterior. And the statement says the interior color of the car must not be the same as the exterior color. There's another problem again. I see there's a red here and there's a red again. So we're going to have problems for all cars that happen to be blue and blue inside and outside. They don't want that. Okay. Motors Incorporated wants to display one car of each possible variation of its car in their showroom. The showroom has a floor space of 500 square meters and each car requires 
a floor space of five square meters. Is this display possible? Justify your answer with a calculation. All right, so we wanna display cars, right? We wanna display cars on uh, wherever we might be. Okay, so think about it, right? So we've got an area, there's an area, maybe wherever our shop is, we wanna display all our cars there, all right? All, all possible cars that you can get from us. But we don't want to display a car that has got the same color inside and outside, all right? So we wanna know if we've got 500 square meter space, how can we succeed to fit all our cars in there? First of all, you're gonna need to actually work out how many cars are we talking about here, all right? If we've got five different body colors, uh, body styles, uh, four different colors interior, um, and then six different colors exterior. How many cars in total can we get that are different that don't look the same? All right. That's where we're gonna start. After figuring out how many colors are those, then we're gonna see will they fit in this 500 square meter area that we have where we wanna display them. Keep that in mind. All right. So what I'm what I'm going to do here because we're not gonna have this table again. Where I'm gonna be working, you won't be seeing this table. I want you to pay attention to the fact that the body parts, we've got five in total, five body styles. The interior colors, we've got four in total. And all these exterior colors, there's about six of them in total. So five styles, four interior colors, six exterior colors. All right. So now I'm trying to figure out, first of all, how many possible cars can I create out of this? All possible combinations of cars that I can get, right? All possible... Um, Cars we're gonna get, right? All possible cars we can get. Okay, fine, very, very important. So I've got to decide on three things. So this is how I encourage you to actually do the counting. Here is basically where we're gonna have the body styles. Here is basically where we're gonna have the interior colors, right? And then here we're gonna have the exterior colors. All right, so we've got five different body styles in total. We have four different colors that we can choose from for the inside, and we've got six exterior colors that we can choose from in total. So out of all this, if you've got those possibilities of combining stuff, right, in how many ways can you actually manage to get away with this? So five body styles, four interior colors, six exterior colors. In total, you can succeed to create cars of about 120 different colors. You can get actually 120 possible uh, combinations, right? Uh, combinations that we can get. We can get this number of cars to display. However, we need to remove, right? But we must remove. What are we removing? Cars, because the counting that I did above is inclusive of cars of same color. We must remove cars of same interior, okay? And exterior color. We need to remove those. Which ones are those? Let's go back and check. All right, cool. So if I look here, I see this blue, blue appearing, okay? So out of this, there will be five different body styles, okay? Each with blue inside and blue outside. Just think about it, right? There's body style number one with blue inside and blue outside. Body style number two with blue inside and blue outside. So in total, I'm going to have five cars, right? of blue in and blue out. Blue in, all right, and blue outside, right? So these are going to happen uh, at some point. Again, I'm also going to have colors that are red inside and red outside. There's gonna be body style one, which is red in and red out. Body style two, which is red inside and red outside. So in total, I'm going to also have five red cars that are of uh, same color inside and outside. There will be red inside, and also red outside, right? So in total, I'm gonna have 10 cars that have got the same color inside and outside because we were told that the interior color of the car must not be the same as the exterior color. And I'm noticing here that there'll be 10 cars of that kind, right? So that means out of my 120, I now need to remove, right, 10. All those five blue cars plus all those five red cars in total will be 10 cars that will have the same color inside and outside, right? So which means from that, if I remove those 10, that means in total, we have, uh, we have 120 minus 10, which is equals to 110 cars to display. Very powerful, okay? Now each car takes five square meters. 
So the space they'll take, okay, or space required to display 110 cars will be 110 times five square meters because each car takes five square meters. Okay, and then this actually is going to amount to something awesome. 110 times 5 is just 550. Let's confirm that. 110 times 5. You're getting 550 square meters. So the space required will just be 550 square meters. Okay, but the question clearly says we only have, right, 500 square meters to display this. So, no. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have enough space. So we won't have enough space to display all these cars because we need 550, but we only, have, um, we only have about 500 square meters. Therefore, the conclusion is we cannot succeed to fit them. We cannot fit all cars, right? Um, all cars for display, okay? Very sad, okay, very, very sad. Right, so this is basically what would happen if you had to work out this kind of a question. Figure out how many cars in total you need to display. After figuring out how many cars need to be displayed, each one takes five square meters. If you multiply the number of cars times the space that each one takes, we end up with 550, but we only have 500. So unfortunately, sorry, we won't be able to succeed to feed all the cars in the required space. We're coming back with a lot of very exciting content. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.